So if you're a girl who grew up going to youth group, listening to MXPX and begging your mom to let you dye your hair, then she's your hero. What's up everybody, I am Finn McKenty and this is the Punk Rock NBA. Now I don't know about you, but if there was a scene Mount Rushmore, there are four people that I personally would put on it. Gerard Way, Pete Wentz, Brandon Urie, and Haley Williams. Because these are pretty much like the four most important people in say the last 15 years or so of alternative music. But there's one of those people that I don't hear about quite as much as the others, and that person is Haley Williams. Which is too bad, because I think there's a lot that we can learn about the music industry and really just about life in general by answering some of the big questions about her and her career. Isn't she just an industry plant? Didn't she like screw over everybody else in the band? Those are the questions that I will try to answer in this video. And spoiler warning, my answer to all those questions is no. And I will explain exactly why in the rest of this video. But first, I wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. You guys know that I'm a huge believer in self-improvement and self-education and building the skills that you need to bring your ideas to life. And Skillshare is a great way to do exactly that. But what a lot of you may not know is that I have actually worked in online education as my day job for the last seven years, and I sincerely believe in Skillshare. This stuff can and will change your life if you actually put in the work. There's tons of content to explore, real projects to create, and also, very importantly, the support of fellow creatives. And I could go on forever about all the great classes they have, but just a few that I personally suggest are Gary Vaynerchuk's social media class. Honestly, I don't think that I would be here doing what I am now without some of the things that I've learned from him about social media. Also, Rand Fishkin's introduction to SEO. He's kind of like the Tony Hawk of SEO and just generally an incredibly insightful guy. And also Jessica Hish's hand lettering for designers. She's one of the absolute best in the game at hand lettering and I love learning from her. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable. If you get an annual subscription, it actually works out to less than 10 bucks a month. And the first 500 people who click the link in the description will get two free months of Skillshare Premium. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. I'm gonna assume that most people watching this are pretty familiar with Haley, but for those who aren't or anybody who needs a quick refresher, here is her career in 30 seconds or so. She grew up in the South singing in church groups. Paramore started in 2004. They put out their first album in 2005. And in 2007, they released their second album, Riot, which is really what put Paramore on the map. They put out another pop punk album in 2009 and then took a little bit of a break and came back in 2013 with their self-titled album that was a little less pop punk and a little bit more just rock. Ain't it fun? They came back in 2017 with their next album. It was more like an early 80s new wave kind of thing. They were no longer the same pop punk band that you may have known from Misery Business. And earlier this year, 2020, she put out her first solo album which sounds like this. Ray. And along the way, Paramore got three platinum albums, a couple gold albums, a Grammy. All the original members of the band quit. One of them came back. She did some huge mainstream features with artists like Zed and B.O.B. Married Chad Gilbert from Newfound Glory, then divorced him and started a hair dye company called Good Dye Young. There's a lot of details that I missed there, but that's it in broad strokes. So with that out of the way, let's get into the big questions. <laughs> First of all, isn't she just an industry plant? Didn't she screw over the rest of the band? This seems to be the biggest source of drama and controversy around Haley, and only she knows exactly what happened. But from what I can tell, it's something like this. Somehow or another, Atlantic Records discovered her when she was about 14 or 15 and signed her with the intent of making her like a solo pop star. They were hoping she might be like the next Avril. But here's the thing. The label didn't want to sign Paramore. They wanted to sign Haley. But she didn't want to be a solo artist. She wanted to be in a band, so she insisted on bringing Paramore along with her. But she was the only one with an actual deal with Atlantic. The people in the band were just hired guns who had their own contract with Fueled by Ramen. And according to them, they were treated pretty badly by the labels, management team, and pretty much everybody else in the industry. The label only begrudgingly recognized them as an actual band. Even after Pharaoh began sharing songwriting credits, he and the other members were often ignored and pushed around by Atlantic and Williams reps. We didn't understand why Haley was the only one signing the contract since we were told this was a band, Pharaoh claimed, but we were too young to grasp all of this. 
That is according to one of the two founding members of the band who quit back in 2010. Now, I don't know if all that is exactly how all this went down. That version of the events does sound believable to me, and I'm not saying any of it is okay or justified or anything like that. But if I put on my record label executive hat, I get it. And that's why it sounds believable to me. Because here is the most fundamental truth of the music industry, or really the entertainment industry in general. There is nothing more valuable than a star. And by star, I mean people who are born with charisma, the kind of people who just naturally make everybody pay attention to whatever they're doing. People like Pete Wentz, Gerard Way, Corey Taylor, Ronnie Radke, they are the rock equivalent of Britney Spears, Ariana Grande, or Justin Bieber. This is why The Rock gets paid more than anybody else because you put him in a movie and it's gonna sell a certain amount of tickets. And it's the same thing in music. Stars move the needle more than anything else. And so because of that, they're worth tens or potentially even hundreds of millions of dollars to their label and management. And whenever that much money is at stake, there are some people out there who will do a lot of shady shit to get it. So looking at it from the viewpoint of the label, when they look at Haley, they see a star, some of them could potentially make them millions and millions of dollars. But when they look at the other people in the band, they just see dudes with guitars. And again, I'm not saying that that is right or fair. I think it's super shitty. But that is the way that they see things. Like every time that I buy peanut M&Ms, I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever <laughs> done for myself. And what makes Haley such a star? Well, she is someone that I would call the total package. Someone with off the charts charisma, tons of musical talent, a great performer, and has the look. It's hard enough to find somebody with just one or two of those qualities, let alone all of them in one person. I think with a lot of the biggest stars in the world and her, relatability is the key. They're successful because they're the idealized version of their fans. When their fans watch their video or see them on stage, they see themselves. Only cooler, confident, more successful, probably a little bit older. And there's a part of you that looks up there and says, you know, that could be me. Blink were the idealized version of that 90s suburban skater kid like me. My Chemical Romance were the idealized version of that depressed mall emo kid. Five Finger Death Punch are the idealized version of the Monster Energy Ford F-150 AR-15 military bro. And Haley is the idealized version of the alternative girl next door. She's a little bit edgy. She's got the orange hair. She's in a rock band, but she's not too edgy or scary. So if you're a girl who grew up going to youth group, listening to MXPX and begging your mom to let you dye your hair, then she's your hero. She's the person that you want to be, especially because she was only a couple years older than most of her fans, which actually brings up my next point, a very important one. I just forgot the words. <laughs> She was so young when the band was forming and all that label drama happened. She was like 14 or 15, I think. Can you really expect a 15 year old to understand what's happening there and play hardball with these major label record executives and lawyers? So to the extent that something shady may have happened, and again, we don't know what actually went down, the people to blame for that are not Haley or the Farrow brothers or anybody else in the band who are literally children. It's the industry people who put those deals together. And I guess maybe the band members' parents who should be looking out for this stuff. Remember, they were literally children. With that said, as far as the idea of her screwing over the rest of the band, it actually seems to me like she did fight pretty hard for the idea of Paramore as a band rather than a vehicle for her as an individual. It's just not what I want, she says of the possibility of mainstream solo stardom. I don't know if I would be able to face thousands of people if I couldn't look to my left and my right and behind me and realize that I'm surrounded by people who know exactly who I am. So here's the bottom line. If you're in a band with someone like her who has that just elite tier star power, like her or Brendan Urie or Gwen Stefani or Ronnie Radke, you're always going to be in their shadow because they are the star. I know that may not be fun to hear. It can be a rough blow to the ego, but that's just the way it is. It's the same thing if you're working for one of these mega charismatic CEOs like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs. So you can either accept that and make the most of this opportunity, or you can choose to get mad about it and ruin what is very likely the best thing that ever happened to you. Hi, can you see your my zits? Which brings me to the next thing you oftentimes hear about Haley. Haley Williams is great. She's one of the best female vocalists in rock. Now, don't get me wrong. The fact that she's a woman in a very male dominated scene definitely has to be brought up. That is a big part of her story. But personally, I find it very dismissive when people refer to her or anyone else as a female vocalist or female fronted rather than just a vocalist because A, that reduces her to her gender and B, because that puts her or any other female musician in a separate category from their peers. But with that said, in her own words, the industry did kind of look at her that way as someone to just kind of put into that edgy girl singer spot. Avril Lavigne had recently broken through wetting the industry's appetite for punky alternatives to Britney and Christina. I don't think I would have been signed if Avril hadn't happened. 
And unfortunately, she oftentimes does get compared to other female vocalists simply for the fact that they're both women. But that said, I have heard a lot of women say that Haley was a role model for them when they were younger and inspired them to do or achieve something, whether that's in music or work or school or whatever. So clearly the fact that she's a woman in a male dominated genre did mean something to a lot of people and she used that to make a positive impact. Wow. Hey, there's me. There I am. Which brings us to the last point, which is usually some variation on, they sold out, she ruined the band. They went pop after the Farrow Brothers quit when they got fed up with all her BS. Well, part of that is true. They definitely did change. Their newer stuff sounds pretty much nothing like their first two or three albums. And if you don't like it, that's totally fair. I'm not a huge fan of it either. But what I think is not so fair is to assume that those changes were selling out or that they happened because of the lineup changes. The argument about like, after the Farrow Brothers left, the band sucked. It's funny to me because if you listen to the music that Josh Farrow now makes, it's actually pretty similar to Paramore's pop stuff. So if he quit because he didn't like the music, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for him to then go make that same kind of music, right? And as for the selling out thing, obviously I don't know what's going on in Haley's brain, but that seems pretty unlikely to me given that she's always actively resisted taking that pop star kind of route that the label clearly wanted her to take. What seems a lot more likely to me is that she and the rest of the band just wanted to make different music at 27 or 28 than they did when they were 15 or 16 years old. I mean, think about the massive changes in their lives during that period. In the time between Riot and her solo album, they won a Grammy and a couple platinum records. They sold millions and millions of albums, went on tour all over the world. She got married and divorced. They went through all that lineup drama. And I'm sure they also just grew up and changed a lot the same way that anybody does when they grow up from being a teenager to an adult. And their music reflects that. Now, with that said, I do think it's pretty impressive how they've been able to largely retain their fan base even as the music changed. And I think that's because unlike bands who do change for purely commercial reasons, and fans can tell when that's happening, with Haley and Paramore, to me, it feels very sincere and authentic. And so as they grow and their music changes, the fans grow along with them. And Haley's also stayed very connected to her roots, especially for somebody as famous as she is. For example, the features she did with bands like Set Your Goals, American Football, The Chariot, and Say Anything, which she totally did not have to do. She obviously did it because she just likes those bands, probably friends with them. But on the other hand, she just recently turned down a Lil Uzi Vert feature. She said yes to Set Your Goals, but no to Lil Uzi Vert. Not exactly the career path of somebody that's trying to sell out. Another example of that is how she decided to stop playing Misery Business and kind of disowned the lyrics. I know it's one of the band's biggest songs, but it shouldn't be used to promote anything having to do with female empowerment or solidarity. I'm so proud of Paramore's career, it's not about shame. It's about growth and progression, and though it'll always be a fan favorite, we don't need to include it on playlists in 2020. So to me personally, as somebody who's a huge believer in pushing yourself to grow as a human, even when it's uncomfortable, and even when it means walking back something that you used to really believe in and taking a little bit of heat for that, I love to see this kind of growth and I think it's a perfect example of why Haley and Paramore have stayed relevant for so long. Because she seems like a sincere, authentic, relatable person. Like someone that probably most of us would be friends with. And she's always been very open about her personal struggles and issues of mental health and stuff like that. And I think that's something that we just need very badly right now in an era where all of us are feeling so much pressure to put this image out on social media like we have some perfect life and we've got it all figured out. And it's comforting to know that even somebody like Haley fucks up sometimes too. I also think it's worth mentioning that she's probably done as much as anybody else to bring mainstream attention to like real DIY punk and hardcore. Actually, maybe the most out of anybody from like that kind of era now that I think about it. Davey Havoc and Pete Wentz are up there as well. I'm sure a lot of people got into hardcore by looking up more about them and their influences, but I think you can make the case for Haley for a couple reasons. As far as AFI goes, they certainly did well for themselves and continue to, but Haley and Paramore are just on a whole other level of mainstream stardom. Like my sister-in-law, who's an army wife that listens to country, knows who Haley is and can sing along to a few Paramore songs. And for anybody who may not understand exactly how big Paramore was and is, they currently have just a little bit under 10 million Spotify listeners, which is one and a half times as many as Slipknot. Fall Out Boy, I'd say, are equally big in the mainstream sense, and Pete's roots in the 90s vegan straight edge hardcore kind of scene are well documented. I've talked about them before. If you haven't checked out his old band, Race Trader, definitely do. They were sick. <laughs> Yeah. 
but I don't think people were aware of that back then. If you turn the clock back to 2007, he was on the cover of J14 and hanging out with Paris Hilton, and meanwhile, Haley was doing features with The Chariot. Kind of tells you where their priorities were at, I think. And she's always repped hardcore in mainstream media. Like she was on MTV News showing off her car, which was covered in stickers from bands like Madball, Gorilla Biscuits, Have Heart, American Nightmare, and Bridge Nine. She still wears Descendants merch all the time on photo shoots and stuff. And for anybody who says that she only likes this stuff because of Chad Gilbert, her ex-husband, please give me a fucking break. The whole thing like discrediting women and saying that the only reason that they could possibly like this music is because their boyfriend got them into it is so sexist and insulting, such a small brain take. She was into that stuff before she met Chad, she's still into it, and guess what? She's done more for hardcore than you ever will. I mean, think about how many people were like Haley or Paramore super fans and went down the rabbit hole of trying to find everything she's ever done, and they were like, oh, she did something with this band called Set Your Goals. I'll check that out. Oh, shit, this is fucking awesome. And that was like their entry point into hardcore? I would bet a lot. I think you could also make the case that she was part of why there are so many girls in the next generation of the scene. The whole like MySpace, post-hardcore, metalcore, deathcore kind of thing. Because if you remember, there were actually a lot of girls in that scene. And they were listening to stuff like Suicide Silence and Whitechapel and Old Bring Me the Horizon, all of which was heavy as fuck. And I have to think that Haley was kind of indirectly influential there. Opening the door for a lot of young girls to feel like it was okay for them to listen to stuff like that. And unfortunately, the metalcore and deathcore scenes are pretty much a giant sausage fest now. Very few women to be found. So maybe we need to ask Haley to give us another tour of her car or something, because I think it was a lot cooler when it was more than just like a bunch of dudes with beards. But that is a conversation for another video. So if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this, is to put yourself in her shoes circa 2004 or so, when she was being courted by Atlantic, just 15 or 16 years old. Feeling the pressure of making these decisions that would affect her for the rest of her life and publicly play out in front of tens of millions of people. It's easy to sneer and call her a sellout and say that she screwed over the rest of the band. But do you really think that's what happened? Like, do you really think that's the kind of person she is? I don't know her personally, but I find that kind of hard to believe. And can you say that you would have done anything any differently or better if you were in that situation at her age? I definitely can't. I'd probably fuck it up even now. So, just like the rest of us, Haley isn't perfect. I'm sure she'd be the first to admit that she's made some mistakes along the way. She'll always have critics, of course, just like anybody else. But there are millions and millions of people out there who love her work. I think that says a lot. All right, my friends, that does it for this video about Haley and Paramore. I would love to know what you think in the comments. Before I let you go, number one, if you haven't checked out the Punk Rock NBA podcast, you can do that at the link in the description. That's the show where I sit down with musicians and artists and creators and anybody else who has managed to turn their passion into their full-time job. And I ask them exactly how they did it with the goal of pulling out advice so that you can do it too. You can get that at the link in the description. And I also want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially the people who support at the true cult level or above. It is because of your support that we're able to do the podcast and a lot of other cool things to the channel, so I'm sincerely grateful for your support. Patrons get every podcast a week early. There's a members-only Discord server that I'm in all the time. There's a chance to have me review your band or YouTube channel or design portfolio or any other project that you might want to get my feedback on. So if you want to check that out, you can join at the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time. Wait, why are, why are you all happy? That's If you're under that... That height, you get a discount. Oh. <laughs> it's not like a... Oh. I didn't read it. I was just excited I was taller than something.